Welcome back to you and our audience. Thanks you for returning. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Scott Nygaard, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Lee Health, an integrated health system based in Fort Myers, Florida. Dr. Nygaard, welcome. Thanks, Mark, for having me on today. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes, absolutely. So great to have you. Why don't we begin at the beginning? Uh, why don't you just briefly introduce, introduce yourself personally, professionally, uh, and share a little bit about uh, background about what uh, Lee Health, uh, uh, about the size and shape of Lee Health, and then I'll ask you about your organization's journey into population health. Yeah, sounds good. So um, I'm the uh, eldest of three sons. I was born in Minnesota. Um, I uh, trained at the University of Iowa in pulmonary critical care medicine. Um, shortly after that, I moved to Appleton, Wisconsin, where uh, a couple years into that area, just practicing medicine, I ended up on the leadership side. And uh, I've had a number of different inter interesting roles in different systems across the country. Um, there I served as the chief medical officer and uh, interim CEO for a few years. Um, at that time, we did a turnaround uh, in the organization, uh, lost $21 million at one point. Um, and got things turned around, subsequently moved to uh, Via Christi, now Ascension Health in Wichita, Kansas, where I served as a senior vice president for corporate services. And then most recently, over the last 11 years, I've been at Lee Health, where I currently serve uh, for the past four years as the chief operating officer um, for the health system. And how many hospitals, beds, staff, that kind of thing? Yeah, so Lee Health is an integrated system, as you mentioned in your opening comments. Um, we have four adult hospitals, 1,624 beds. Um, we also have a children's hospital, 170 beds. Uh, we have a rehab hospital, 60 beds. Um, and then we have a diverse set of assets in the community, a physician group that's grown to be about 520 providers, uh, 300 advanced uh, providers, uh, and at 90 locations. We have a home health business, durable medical equipment business, and then a set of skilled nursing facilities uh, across the community. So we provide a lot of different services and care in Fort Myers, Florida. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, doctor. So tell us a little bit about you, you uh, your organization was involved in the Next Generation ACO program, which has now been shifted out and you're going into the ACO plus program. And you've also been involved in the federal bundled payments program. Tell us about those involvements, if you would. So a number of years back, um, we really thought we needed to move our system towards um, value. And we know that that is not, you know, a easy transformation that we had to start getting some experience in this space. When I first came here 11 years ago, people asked uh, immediately where we're going to be an ACO. And my answer was not yet. <laughs> and the reason was we really didn't have the infrastructure available to us to even begin to talk about managing um, the care, um, which requires a lot of different data and uh, available information, plus just care processes and a mindset. You know, this was really, uh, like many markets, uh, a fee-for-service market and trying to get the infrastructure in place to really, you know, have an ability to start that journey uh, has occurred over the last uh, few years. Um, so our first foray in was to start with the next-gen ACO. Um, and we've been in that for five years. We'll just be completing that at the end of this year. And we've reapplied for, as you know, uh, CMS, uh, CMMI continually changes the models. Um, and so we're now going to be in the MSSP plus um, program. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tell me, doctor. So what were the key things that you needed to set up to be successful in next gen? You referenced two of the biggest ones, mm -hmm. care management. Uh, care management uh, architecture, and also a data analytics architecture. Tell, tell us a little bit about the evolution of those and any other elements. Yeah, so I think like a lot of things, you know, the beginning of good care always starts with good documentation, and that translates into things like, you know, risk manage, uh, risk stratification coding through, um, you know, healthcare chronic conditions and things that should be included in the record. Um, it's amazing how often they are, haven't been included. Um, and in my mind, they should just be there regardless of whether we're in a risk-based world or not, because they connote the overall condition, uh, you know, of the patient and the, you know, other medical conditions they might have that could impact their care. So accurate coding um, for diseases. Uh, access in your community. When I first came to Fort Myers, access was 
terrible. We really couldn't have managed anything. Um, something that has been used in the industry to manage access time to third next available appointment was 65 days out and you really can't manage anything when people are looking to show up at the emergency room or an urgent care center as their primary care access. So access to primary care is critical. Um, understanding high risk conditions and how they might progress in that whole area of chronic disease management um, was critical. Uh, the other things, you know, just, we always talk about seamless care in medicine, but I think those of us who've lived in it know it's not seamless. So the transitions of care across boundaries from a hospital to some other disposition outside the hospital requires a lot of communication and care planning. Um, you know, the development of a broad-based network. So you do have geographic access, I think, in the community. Um, as we always say in medicine, a focus on just the quality and outcomes, which is critical to many of these programs anyway. And they do want to see that the beneficiaries in the ACO are getting quality um, service. And I'd say the last area was a focus on just pharmacy uh, benefits and management of the pharmaceutical side of uh, patient care, which can be complex and you know, something that sounds simple as med reconciliation becomes problematic when you're, you know, transitioning people in care. Yeah, absolutely. Of all of those elements, what, what was the hardest or what were the hardest to, to uh, uh, evolve forward? One, I just think the time it took to kind of build and access, you know, we couldn't even really talk about this, like I said, so that took several years. And that's why we weren't prepared to enter into the journey until uh, you know, about five years ago, when we finally did have adequate access to recruitment. Uh, physician group, when I came here, was about 80 physicians. Like I said, it's grown to over 520 and 300 advanced providers. So that really was foundational. The second was uh, all systems have a lot of information. We didn't have it in an organized format. And so building a, a data platform, which is continuing to mature, by the way, um, I would say, as you go through this process, you have lots of learnings about information that you might need or even the way you present it to clinicians for ease of use. Um, is it accessible at the point of care when they need it? Yeah. Would you, can we drill down just a, a, a couple of thousand feet on the, um, on the data? Sure. What, thank you. What, um, what were the key elements kind of the key uh, bricks in your in your house there in terms of the data analytics. Our audience is at all levels in developing their analytics for population health. Um, what were kind of a few of the key steps that you took that turned out to be the most meaningful and what was involved in architecting your data analytics architecture for pop health? Yeah, so I think at the foundation, we just started to try by identifying what are all the sources of data that we have, and how do we define, you know, what's going to be the source of truth for a given measurement. Um, it's amazing how many conflicting data points you can get as you get it from the payer or sometimes internal to different aspects of your system, or from other electronic medical records. So how are we going to actually define you know, the source of truth for the metrics. So we're consistently pulling the information in a, you know, predictable and consistent manner with whatever bias it has in it. I think we have to accept that all data has bias and may have some errors from entry. Um, and then we organized uh, what we call the, an ACE analytical center of excellence um, to really govern and produce the type of reports that were meaningful to individuals in terms of trying to help them provide care. Uh, in some cases, we built those dashboards internal for our physicians that were employed inside of our electronic medical record. Um, in other cases, uh, you know, we're in the process and not really completed in terms of trying to build dashboards that would be available to, you know, independent clinicians who are part of the network so that they can have the information available. Yeah. At the early phase, we were simply handing, you know, out some paper reports, if you will, electronic papers, I call it. <laughs> Um, and it was helpful, but uh, not optimal in terms of workflow. So I think those are two of the bigger learnings. What can you, doctor, can you tell me a little bit about the people element in the data analytics development? Did you have data scientists? Did you, did you have analysts who were already in place in some way? Did you recruit people? Very often it's uh, the recruitment of nurse case managers, for example, who might be good at uh, with working, uh, good at working with data. Um, 
how, how did you build up the team that is supporting you on the analytics side? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. So we started with literally nothing and no leadership. And I would say our early philosophy was, um, you know, you can go write your own reports on your own. It's kind of a self-service mindset. And I think what we found is people were spending more time trying to reconcile the data. You know, we realized the data was not being pulled consistently. Um, a lot of disputes over, you know, the source of truth, as I said, because we didn't have common mechanisms or yeah. uh, pulling the data. So that really got us to say we needed to provide a leader uh, in that area who would build out a team of clinical people. And we did ultimately hire two data scientists over time who really understand how to make data visual, make it easily, you know, readable to the clinician. Um, and they spend a lot of time with the teams just trying to understand, well, what is it you want? And let us help you try to identify the best source for that data. That's not really, you know, work clinicians are used to. Um, when presented with the data, it's very helpful to them in their decision-making process. So it was definitely a growth function that needed to occur by hiring talent uh, and just uh, working directly with the clinicians. Were you able to, one of the questions that is often asked is, where do you get the people? Uh, did you find people from outside healthcare and you train them on healthcare? Or did you find people from inside healthcare and you train them on analytics generally, or both? So uh, we had a few people, like you mentioned, nurse clinicians that had analytical skills that had worked in other areas um, in the health system that had an interest in being part of that team. The data scientists, we were fortunate enough to have a local university who produces uh, you know, data scientists. Um, they had not all worked in healthcare, but um, it's amazing how they really do understand data and the visual presentation and uh, asking the right questions. And once given access to the right databases, uh, you know, they've been instrumental, not just in Pop Health, but in our overall operations in terms of report writing. And, you know, as we always say, we wanna bring information that creates actionable insights. We don't wanna just produce a report. So we would like you to have information that you could actually act on. Yeah, absolutely. So now I want to ask about physician culture. Um, I have been in healthcare publishing for 32 years and I've been writing about physicians and physician culture for that long. It's been fascinating. Um, we all know, I mean, I admire physicians so much. They're so smart, hardworking, dedicated, but they can also sometimes be a little bit resistant to change, yeah. um, perhaps. And um, how did, I know you said at the beginning, it was a little bit difficult because um, affirming the source of truth, kind of those kinds of issues. How did that all get worked out? And how did you get physicians onto the same page so they, that everyone felt that they were aligned with the goals of the value-based care delivery programs? Yeah, Mark, that's another great question. <laughs> um, and always a challenge in terms of creating, you know, we use this word physician engagement. The word sounds easy, but I always say the work is hard. Um, and the usual uh, idea when you, as a physician, I can say go to physicians is change is good, you go first, is kind of the mindset, you know, um, that somebody else should lead that change. And, I, you know, some of their feelings, I believe, are justified. They've had bad experiences. People haven't listened to what they need to, you know, practice medicine in an optimal time frame. I can remember the first organization I worked in when we had a health plan and somebody said, well, this data is available. And... Uh, we had our CMIO go through the workflow and it took him as an experienced user 30 minutes to find all the data he needed for a single visit. We said, well, how does that work in a 15 minute visit? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. Well, doesn't. and then, and then the, so, the other thing that you always get at first, of course, and I know you experienced this is, my patients are sicker, the data is yeah. bad, you don't know what you're talking about, it's not meaningful. So how do you get over that? So as we gave out reports, of course, that again was the very first response. You know, I'm not sure the data is accurate. Where did you get it from? How do you know that this is a source of truth? And we had a number of physicians who were on our governance committee for the various you know, value-based programs we have would go back to their office and validate whether the information was accurate or not. Some things as simple as 
care gaps. You know, did my patient get all they need for diabetes or for asthma care or for cardiovascular care? And I think what they came to find out in general, the information wasn't perfect. No information is perfect, but it was a lot more accurate than they had anticipated. And so they started to build some confidence and trust in the data that we were pulling and presenting to them. And then next we had, as I said, work on something that would work better within their own workflows, but always a lot of discussion about, you know, risk adjustment. My patients are sicker, you know, is this accurate? Where did you get the information? That's just part of the journey you have to accept. Absolutely. Uh, share with us a couple happy things, a uh, couple areas where you think that your organization has made some really good advances briefly. So one area is this whole area of care coordination and uh, focusing on readmissions. I think we learned that both in the ACO and in bundled payments. And uh, while I always say readmissions is measured at the turnstile of the hospital, all the activity that prevents readmissions occurs in a community outside the walls of a hospital. Um, it may start at the front door of your emergency department. So we worked on a lot of process improvements and getting our emergency doctors who previously thought, hey, when somebody shows up, the best thing to triage them is admit them. And that's great. And uh, we had to do a lot of education and engagement with them and came up with this mindset of actually what we are asking you to do, if possible and safe and good care for the patient help them do a U-turn and get the care they need coordinated back in their community with their primary care physician or specialty care physician, whoever's the best point. Uh, you would be amazed how hard it is to get an appointment in a community. <laughs> you know, you'd think it's easy. Um, and if we're honest, oftentimes we simply transfer that burden to the patient and said, yeah. you go get the appointment. So we put discharge nurses into the emergency room and care coordinators who would actually schedule that appointment with the office directly before they left. And so a lot of little things, but they make a big difference for the patient's care. And I think they're where the patient would prefer to see the, you know, um, prefer to receive their care is at home. Yeah, absolutely. Altogether, overall, what have been the biggest couple few lessons learned so far on your journey that you would share with our audience? You know, we've talked a lot about data. I think getting data that can actually work in the workflow and timing of an appointment, because I still think we have a lot of productivity-based systems while we're trying to make this transformation in healthcare, and we haven't fully moved away from, you know, compensation models that kind of pay in that manner. We've started to make some adjustments, but uh, like I say many times, a lot of these things are so complicated, we can't just flip on a light switch to build capacity or workflows or processes. So, I think more and more work this year, we're really focused on trying to develop meaningful dashboards that can be pulled up in the workflow at the time of appointment that are more color coded and visual and kind of bring, you know, the top issues right in front of physicians at the point of care. So they're not searching, finding, trying to aggregate the data. So I would say that's a big piece of our work this year in terms okay. of things we need to do better. Great. Well, that along with what, what else, what will happen in the next two years in your organization uh, around all this? So we've had uh, a mindset to continue to expand into the value-based uh, work. Um, and we've kind of moved away from the term population health because it's a bit of a buzzword. It's not really clear what that means. But when we talk about value, we can talk about the patient experience. We can talk about quality. We can talk about service. We can talk about cost. And I think that word resonates better with our um, clinicians. So I think over the next couple of years, we're trying to take the next steps to try to continue to be more efficient and effective in the care that we give uh, a focus on trying to, you know, continue to provide care at home. We have recently also uh, worked with a company to develop more urgent care services at home, which is actually being very well received, um, particularly by families and people who you know, don't enjoy the experience of coming to find a parking spot and get an appointment and wait in the waiting room. Um, that's a value add. We're looking at the hospital at home model as a mechanism of delivering, you know, appropriate care or things that could be stratified and done at home. Um, and then we're working closely with our home health agencies and skilled nursing facilities, which still, I think, need more education and understanding of you know, the importance of the processes that they have and how they impact the care of the patient. 
Um, and many of those agencies are independent, so they may not share our vision immediately, but we have to continue to work um, to express how we can align with them and they can align with us. Terrific. Well, that's, you've got, your plate is full. <laughs> yeah. right. I always say in healthcare, we won't be bored anytime soon. So yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's good. right. Absolutely. Final thoughts. For, well, first of all, any advice that you'd like to give to our audience? Because you were quite advanced compared to many people in our in organizations in our audience. So what what advice would you give them based on your journey so far? So I, I think, you know, from the very beginning, be open, honest, and transparent. Develop a good governance model um, that engages your physicians and gives them voice. Um, be, be prepared to kind of you know, as I say, follow the bouncing ball. There'll be a lot of questions. They're all well intended. Um, sometimes they can seem disruptive to individuals that they're trying to block progress. I think they're literally trying to understand, you know, what's being asked of them and how does that actually work and what is the impact on their own clinic and flow. Um, I would say we talked a lot about data and transparency. You've got to be transparent with the data. You know, you can't, as we always say, you know, manage what you can't measure and then it has to work in those workflows. Uh, the last thing I would say, just care coordination and the challenge of that is easy as it sounds. We use a lot of words about seamless care and whatnot. And I think we all know it's not seamless, <laughs> even those of us who work in the system, that it's a challenge um, to navigate across the boundaries. And the literature is clear that there are risks and uh, challenges when we do those handoffs. So working with all those different uh, individuals, providers, organizations that we mentioned earlier on, be it home health or skilled nursing, your ED physicians, there's work to be done by everybody to make this uh, a successful initiative in your organization. And then, the patients. and then I just say patience because there's a lot of trap lines to run and uh, you can't work on everything even though it feels like you should. So pick and choose the areas you want to put energy and effort in and celebrate your successes. Right. right. And I think that's important to celebrate success. I think that's very wise, Dr. Neckard. Um, it's also what others have told us, right? Like you can't, you can't boil the ocean. You right. can't build Rome in a day, whatever, <laughs> whatever. Right. Um, right. Whatever analogy you want to use, use it. Right. <laughs> you know? And so organizations that do well have early wins they celebrate them, they build on them, they build confidence in that new culture that they're creating. Yeah. I can tell that you're doing that with your colleagues as well. So yeah. any, any closing thoughts? No, I think we've touched on the high points. I would just say, you know, if you're gonna get in this journey, be clear on the beginning, you know, the why you're getting into it. Uh, like when I said, I came to Lee Health, everybody was asking, are we gonna get into it? And when you asked the why, there was no understanding as to the why. It was more, well, this concept is floating around. I've heard colleagues talk about it. Yeah. And then make sure you have a firm foundation on which to build, because I think if you don't have a firm foundation, as I've often said to our physicians, you know, we're not going to put the roof up first. <laughs> we have yeah. to have a foundation on which to build this house. And, uh, you know, and then enjoy the journey. I always have a little saying, I say, you know, have fun. Um, make a difference every day and enjoy the journey in that order, by the way. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. And wow, we've had, our metaphors are flying, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I would yeah. just say that um, per one of the metaphors, uh, you know, building the roof first, you know, the, another way to look at it, and I can tell that you're doing this right, is uh, what I hear from really pioneering leaders like yourself all around the country is you need to be able to wave a flag of mission and vision, right? Yes. And you have to be able to explain, as you said, you have to be able to explain to people why you're doing something, you know? It's not just like one day we're all going to put on, um, you know, uh, weird animal costumes because, right? It ha there has right. to be a, a, a rationale that, that can be understood and, then people will follow it because in healthcare, people are mission driven, but they have to, if the mission goes beyond the immediate, for clinicians, the immediate care of the individual they're taking care of in that moment, it has to be explained to them and it has to be articulated in a way that they can under, understand and support, right? Absolutely. 
Yep. Yeah. That's so critical that, and I think, you know, people want to do the right thing for their patients. That's is their intrinsic motivation. Um, but it also has to work, like I said, within the time or the workflow or the environment they find themselves challenged with and is a challenge. So both sides have to be represented. We can't just blindly say we're doing this all for the patient, the disruption of their own life or extending their work day or, you know, making the, the workflow awkward. So there's a balance there that needs to be struck. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Nygaard. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. I know we've learned a lot and uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark, for having me today. I much appreciate it as well. Have a good uh, day. You too. And best wishes on your journey forward. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. That concludes this session. Thank you for all those who are, have participated in it.